Hey, what's up everybody? It's Lids, and we're back to break some more thrones. And of course, last time we took down the Nilfgaardians in a big battle at Rosberg over here. And, uh, well, you can see the fiery remains of where we fought that battle. But now we are looking to carry on further into Edirn, and in doing so, into this foresty area over here where we are apparently going to start running into some more Scoitel. And from what I understand, or at least from what I expect, I think we're going to find a lot of random encounters, some ambushes, if you will. Although, at least to start things off here, we've got a shrine, and we've got a little bit of a settlement here. It looks like it has some recruits, so uh, maybe that'll be uh, a nice little boost for us here. Reach the walls, blowing traitors. Let's see if these guys have anything for us. Where's the king? Why did he leave us a black-clad mercy? Uh, yeah, you know, that that is true. He did kind of sort of abandon you. We took everything. I'd head to the wood, but my fear of the Scoitel. Yeah, see, that's the thing, is we're going to run into the Scoitel. Okay. Looks like that's all they're going to talk about. Let's grab some resources. And grab some recruits. It's been a long time since we last got recruits, or at least certainly feels like it. We checked out our notice board yet? I'm not sure if we have. Let's see. So previously, this area was uh, more or less completely blank. We got a whole bunch of stuff here. Okay, so we do get several points of interest very close by. And uh, I was wondering, I mean, given how much blank area we had with no symbols here at all, if perhaps it was going to be that we just would have few, if any, of these points of interest showed up and we would just randomly get thrown into stuff and have no forewarning at all. But uh, it does appear as though we'll at least get some chance. Some chance to prepare. Is there anything up here? Can we even go in that direction? I don't think we can. So let's carry on in that case. And uh, we do have a decent amount of resources. We might be able to purchase some stuff somewhat soon. But there was a point of interest fairly close by here. Meave's ears caught the sound of a ruckus coming from the camp. Thief! Inglet! A pox upon you all! It was her quartermaster hurling oaths at the peasants she had freed from the Nilfgaardian slave convoy. A few had ah. stolen supplies under the cover of darkness and escaped into the woods. Terror and dread gripped the other freed prisoners. Meave mulled over what to do with them, and Reynard, as always, offered some advice. Okay, so I did see that we got a little bit of penalty up there for... It was definitely... Coins. I didn't catch what the other resource was. Probably would, maybe even recruits. But this was, the, or is, the follow-up to that encounter we had previously where we freed those slaves from the North Guardians. We were wondering. It was it was weird. We didn't see any immediate after effects. I mean, of course, we did bring on those, or we freed those slaves and brought them with us. And the game made it sound as if, you know, that was going to translate into us losing resources. But it didn't happen at the time. But now... Now it happened, so interesting. I wasn't sure, wasn't sure if we were to see it on a, a future occasion. It just hadn't yet come to happen. Well, now it has. It is high time they went off on their own, Your Grace. They are too great a hindrance. They slow our march, divert our soldiers from more important tasks. And now this. Gascon was listening to their conversation. Meave shot him a questioning look. I oppose taking them in. So, for consistency... I now oppose forcing them to leave. <laughs> we made their miserable lives our responsibility, did we not? Well then, that is a burden we cannot simply shrug off. That's interesting. Oh, that is interesting. Okay, so we got punished for bringing them on. But now there's the question of, okay, do we decide, okay, enough is enough. They were a burden on us before, they will continue to be a burden on us in the future, so we better just get rid of them. That would be what Raynard is suggesting, which is, uh, again, it was, uh, Gascon who recommended initially to have them leave, and it was, uh, I assume Raynard who recommended that we take them in, although I don't specifically remember if Raynard said that if it was just Gascon arguing against it. But the other thing we could say is... You know, there was a reason why we brought them on at the beginning, and, you know, that reason still stands. We understood the risks when we did it, and perhaps we are still willing to accept those risks and accept that keeping them with us could mean we could lose additional resources. 
I feel like, I'm metagaming a bit here, but I feel like what we just saw was the punishment for doing what the game said we might be punished for. And now this is our test. This is our test. Do we get shaken? Do we lose our composure when we lose those resources and just say, all right, forget about it. Forget about it. We wanted those resources. These guys, these slaves we freed, they're just causing more trouble than they're worth. Get rid of them. Don't ever want to see them again. Or, or do we stick to our guns, be patient, think long term, and say, you know what? Maybe, maybe, although it could cost us additional gold and wood, perhaps, there might be some other benefits to having these pe peasants along with us. I feel like I want to go that route. I feel like this is supposed to be a bit of a trap. A bit of a trap where the game tries to trick you into uh, thinking that you, you might as well get rid of the peasants when perhaps if we are patient enough, we will find some benefit. Whether it's soon down the road or sometime long in the future, who knows, but let's try it. Let us not mince words. We cast off these peasants now, they shall die. Neve said in the end. Let them stay, but I want them watched. They cause any more trouble, military justice they shall face. Understood? The freed prisoners sighed with relief. The wow, we lost morale for that. Them, however, grumbled their disapproval of the Queen's decision. It is an army, not a shelter, they said. Meave's ears surely caught the complaint. But the Queen had never let the opinions of others guide her in such matters, trusting only her own judgment. Hmm. Okay. Once again, we are not always a tyrant. Despite what our early track record may have seemed to have suggested. So the other thing to bear in mind is that there was this shrine here that we did not use, and in many ways the reason why I deliberately opted not to use it was if, say, something happened, like we got into an encounter where we lost morale. So either, either we use this now and get back to neutral, or we say, hey, conveniently, this happens to be right next to the fast travel spot, and perhaps that means that we'll carry on here, and if we can, say, finish a puzzle or some other encounter and get ourselves back to neutral standing, neutral morale, then we can go back here, and rather than having the shrine bring us from negative to neutral morale, we can go from neutral to positive. So, you know, the, the question of can we withstand the short-term setback, and then perhaps, rather than getting a a quick fix to it, get a, uh, a buff. Wait until we can get a buff later on. Okay. I, and, in case you can't tell, that's kind of what I'm thinking we try to do here, at least. We have a fork in the road, point of interest up here, and a puzzle down here. It looks like, yeah, there's some elven ruins to the south, it seemed, and it looks like we might run into many more of those in the future, but I'm curious to check this out here. Huh? It's a dog. I was really expecting some kind of straightforward battle with monsters, but I don't know. It could be some kind of trap, some kind of bait, or it could be, quite simply, just a, a stray dog. What is the deal? Not liking the looks of this, Gascon said. Furrowing his brow, Wave followed his gaze. Before them, beside the road, stood a hut with a scorched thatch roof. Well, I think I know what this abandoned, is. Yet dried fruit and mushrooms hang from the eaves. Famine raging all around, and no one's been tempted. I'd send a scout if I was you. The queen did as Gascon suggested, and sent three infantrymen to reconnoiter. They entered the hut and found only silence, that was soon broken by a blood-curdling growl. The soldiers ran out at full speed, tripping over their own legs. What just happened? Meave drew her sword, convinced a horde of neckers or ghouls would soon attack. But her fears proved unfounded. Instead of monsters, out of the hut came a shaggy dog, a torn scrap of fabric clutched in its teeth. Uh, Milady! One of the soldiers began, his face red with embarrassment, and his hands covering a hole in his breeches. <laughs> it was dark as a well inside, and that hound, it, it jumped out at us all of a sudden, biting it and snapping. 
bad boy, Gascon said with a <laughs> smile, then pulled a hunk of dried sausage from his bag. Bought by this generous offering, the dog calmed down at once. Could it be the one and only, the world famous? Further examination showed the dog was the hut's only resident. Like many others in Edern, its owners had disappeared without a trace. Their loyal mutt still guarded the premises, waiting for his master's return. Let's take him with us, Gascon said. Otherwise, he'll die here of his own hunger or someone else's. Here's Gascon, the person who was saying, Ah, oh, don't bring in the... Don't free the slaves. Don't bring them along with us. They'll just be a burden on us because we're going to need to sacrifice resources to support them. Then just moments afterward... Okay, maybe a little more than moments, but you know what I mean. There's a dog in a very similar situation. I mean, sure, it's a dog compared to people, but still, it's still something that we would need to dedicate resources towards supporting. And uh, now suddenly Gascon does a 180. Says, hold on, hold on. On this occasion, on this occasion, I do think we should help it out. But I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure. I have a suspicion as to who this famous dog might be. Because, well, could it be? The one and only Nickers? Perhaps. Perhaps. If so, then we must take it. A watchful sentry like this could prove useful in our camp, said the Queen. Fine. We can join. It is you'll need a name. How about Raynard? Proposed Gascon. <laughs> a cheeky grin smeared across his face. That way, he'll come when you call, sit on command, and always be a heel. <clears throat> uh, always heel, that is. What's your words? Said Raynard, <laughs> tightly gripping the hilt of his sword. Or you'll learn I'm not the doll as tame as you believe. Enough, both of you. That's an order. As for you... The queen took a good look at the dog, who still had a scrap of fabric in his teeth. Since it seems you have a taste for the cloth of the nether regions, I dub you... Knickers. Exactly. The dog wagged its tail vigorously, as if thoroughly pleased with its new name. Meave's company marched off, a furry new recruit richer. Fantastic. I love it. I love it. And <laughs> we get an achievement for it as well. The card has now been added to our army. So let's check it out. Absolutely. Let's claim it. Absolutely. All right. Now, of course, I think we're technically still over our recruit cap right now. So uh, we may not be able to add Knickers even if we wanted to. But let's at least see what the deal is. Let's see. Knickers, a beast immune so we cannot be manually targeted that's a little bit odd uh, i mean we tend to see with opponents i suppose so that way we can't target them with our abilities i mean i suppose it still works against cpu it just feels a little bit strange permanent resilience so he stays on the board all the time usually that means just lasts from one round to the next but it sounds like permanent resilience would mean play him in round one he lasts in round two and then carries over into round three as well when you play a gold card, summon Knickers from your deck. This unit may raid your hand for yummy treats. <laughs> oh man, that is awesome. I mean, sounds pretty good. Only five? Five uh, recruit cap points? Five provisions? That is surprising. I mean, he's only, only worth five points, so it's not like he's a big game changer. But this is, uh, I mean, he does something similar in Gwent Multiplayer, where... He will randomly raid the battlefield. There's no control over it at all, but it just means you keep him in your deck, and then after a certain amount of time, it's somewhat randomized. He'll end up on the playing field, give you a few extra points, and the points aren't a huge difference maker, but there's something. Sometimes it's enough to be a difference maker, you know, could be that's why you won the round. But oftentimes, more importantly, what it does is it thins your deck, which means they're fewer cards in your deck so especially in matches in which you have multiple rounds that means that you can have a smaller deck so you're more likely to draw the cards that you actually want to have and use so i think we would like to add him if you don't have sausage he's not interested oh okay let's see so yeah you only cost five but then again we are so far so far over our limit right now. We do have an extra card. I mean, that's got to have something to do with it, right? But I mean, even if we got rid of Raynard, who I think is someone we were saying in the past, that we weren't a 
huge fan of at this stage, just because we have so few order abilities. Even if we just removed him altogether, we would still be eight over. That's a lot. That is a lot. And uh, even if, even if Rainer, his ability doesn't really do anything, at the very least, he is a nine point body, which is not that much in uh, Thronebreaker. That would be pretty good in multiplayer, but I mean, perhaps that's reason enough to keep him in here. I don't know. I mean, we really, really want to increase this recruit cap, it seems like. Uh, look at in went multiplayer. Changing your leader ability can change your recruit cap, but I, or provisions in that case, but don't think that was the case in uh, Thronebreaker. I mean, let's exit and lose our changes again. That's why we can't make any changes here without uh, violating that rule. It'd be hilarious if he showed up in the best tent here. Oh, wait, he does! I mean, you can't talk to him, but he is there. That is fantastic. I love it. I love it. Okay. So while we're here, why don't we just take a quick look and see if we can afford to upgrade our, uh, let's see, units, excluding artifacts. We'll take 10% less of your recruit cap. Yeah, either reduce the amount of recruit cap that units cost or increase our, our recruit cap directly, which... Ooh, oh, we lost a lot. Wow. I didn't see how many resources exactly we lost when those uh, people that we freed stole from us, but I'm pretty sure we were over 2,000 coins at the time. Now we're at 1,587. I think we might have lost 500. That is pretty steep penalty. Wow. Okay. I kind of assumed it was just a relatively minor inconvenience, but no, that's that's pretty significant, as it turns out. And uh, especially because that... Uh, okay, we wouldn't have been able to afford Soldier's Quarters 1. We would have been close, but... Okay, I think we hold off for the time being. That is probably the next upgrade we'd like to be able to make. So that means we are looking to get up to about a thousand more gold, and then we'll have some big stuff to do. So, we have acquired Knickers, and I hope we'll get the chance to put them in our deck soon, but again, until we increase our recruit cap or uh, reduce the amount of recruit cap that, that uh, units cost, we will, I think, have to stick with what we have. So why don't we go for this puzzle next and see what this is all about. And what is the deal with... As I was saying, the whole woods area here does make me very suspicious it really feels like just wandering around here we could find people ambushing us and what have you and also i don't know if there's some potential here for hidden pathways i feel like there could be in fact like did we even that when we were looking at the big map i was just looking at the major pathways but we saw at least one hidden area in the previous section we were in like can we even go through here might be able to enter from the other side like can we go through this? No, perhaps not. Okay. Just want to make sure we're not missing anything, but let's carry on in that case. And I think we will continue down the main path before we branch off a bit. Hmm. Okay. What do we have here? More resources. The wood, I think, although useful, is not really the resource that we are in most desperate need of. At the moment. That's a decent amount of coins there. Okay, so this is a puzzle here. It does look an awful lot like some of the Necros we were encountering before. So here we go. Uh, is this a puzzle? Okay, it is. For a second there, it looked like this was going to be a, a battle after all. So in order to evade Nilfgaardian patrols, Mead veered from the main road. This detour, however, presented other dangers. Valyrians lost their way riding through a mist-draped forest. No, we did intend to go through here. <laughs> Following a narrow, overgrown path, they stumbled upon a ruined homestead. It appeared abandoned, yet appearances can be deceiving. Eliminate the ancient foglet. Not a normal foglet. Ancient foglet. Do not let Meave die. Excuse me? Excuse me? <laughs> what? Usually Meave is... I mean, does that mean Meave is going to be a card? 
Usually Meave is not a card. I don't think we've ever seen Meave the card. Obviously, we have Meave's leader ability, but... Okay, so uh, we need to get rid of our opponent, keep Meave alive. It'll be a puzzle, special rules, short and battle, so just one round, and we will have a custom deck, so let's check it out. Okay, so yes, starting in round three, it's just one round. Okay, we do have Meave. Limit the Ancient Foglet. Do not let Meave die. So Ancient Foglet has 45 power. That is a ton. Uh, Meave. So first time we've seen her in Thronebreaker. Love the art. It is the same art from Quentin Multiplayer, but it is just a great looking card. Immobile, so cannot be moved. I'm not accustomed to interruptions. I mean, she's technically not a unit. She's an artifact. So she does not come with any points. We just need to get rid of the Foglet. On turn start, spawn two Foglets. And the Foglets don't recall us what they do. Many primal fears lurk in the hearts of men. Fear of the mist is well founded. So the thing is, they don't have any other units at the moment. They've already passed. They're not going to play any more cards. They have no ability. So it's just going to all be a matter of those Foglets. And... So what we have here, Rivian Sapper, damage unit by two if it was destroyed, repeat this ability. So I imagine this is going to be, once we start seeing those Foglets, the normal Foglets, we'll want to destroy them with this and then repeat the ability so we can ideally destroy more units. Then, ooh, okay. So we have a couple of those. We have a Bomber, so we can set a row on fire. Do the Foglets always show up in this row? Spawn two Foglets, it doesn't specify if they're in that row. It sounds like they could be in either row. The Slinger, we presumably want to wait until those Foglets show up so we can move them and deal damage to them in the process. This could be proactive if we had confidence that uh, they were going to spawn in here. I mean, probably still are going to want to put it here anyway, right? Because that's where the Ancient Foglet is. Wagenberg? Ooh. So this is one of our old staples. Damage all units on an enemy row by this unit's armor amount. Then lose all armor. Gain one armor whenever a card appears on this row. So, the thing is, usually you would play this first. And then just load up on as many units in that same row as possible to maximize the damage on it. But, we already have a ton of units out here. That, or, artifacts out here. The Palisade, let's see. Mobile, Permanent, Resilience, Doomed. It just exists, basically. Then, Therian Hadjuk. This is the first we've seen of it. Give one charge to the card on the right. Well, the only card we have that has an order ability would be the Wagenberg. So that means we can only use this on the Wagenberg. Oh, we don't have any leader ability charges either. Okay, that's worth noting. So this goes with this. That means we can use this ability twice, but bear in mind, once we use the ability... We lose all the armor, so we basically need to start from scratch to build that armor back up, and that means build the damage back up, so this is an odd one. This is an odd one. I think, at least, of course, always need to sort of see what happens the first time around, then we can strategize more deliberately, but I think we start with the bomber and set the throw on fire. I'm assuming that's the way to go here. So here come the foglets, or right, they do move. Okay, what is the deal with them? Every turn on turn end, move one row toward the opponent. If on the melee road, destroy a random palisade instead. There are no palisades, destroy me. Deathwish damage the ancient foglet by five. Okay. So now we start to see what the deal is. Okay. So that means if we don't destroy these foglets here, they will destroy the palisades. And uh, we basically need to destroy all the foglets. Otherwise, we are in trouble. So... Can we move the Ancient Foglet as well? I don't see anything saying that we wouldn't be able to. So if we were to go Stray Slinger here, we could move these two guys back. And damage them by two. And damage the Ancient Foglet. Doesn't really matter where the Ancient Foglet is. I mean, we kind of like to have it in the row that's on fire. But I feel like we might need to Slinger here. In order to keep these guys away. Again, of course, it is our first attempt here. It's the... Oh. Okay, so do they always spawn? They do always spawn in the same row as the Ancient Foglet, it seems. So that means having the Ancient Foglet here in the melee row did just make matters 
uh, exponentially, like twice as, as difficult as it would have otherwise been. So yeah, that was definitely a mistake. So of course, we didn't really know that in advance, uh, but now we do. So that means that we definitely did not, definitely did not want to move the Ancient Fog into the main room. So, uh, I mean, Wagenberg, as we were saying, is usually something you want to play as early as possible. So, I mean, we will, but that again, uh, I think this is already lost at this point. So, we'll just see if we can learn anything else. I think we can, again, confirm that uh, the Foglets will stay in this, or, well, will continue to spawn in this same row as the Ancient Foglet. Also, I guess I had assumed that once the Foglets destroyed a Palisade, that they would destroy themselves as well. They basically, you know, like, they trade a Foglet for a Palisade, but no, they stay here. You don't destroy them. They will stay here, and they will just continue to load up and destroy even more Palisades. So that's worth noting. Oh, also, I had intended, um, yeah, I think rather than playing the Wagenberg, I had intended after having damaged the Foglets and gotten them down to two power to use Rivian Sapper to destroy them and then, you know, chain the damage there to take out a bunch of them. So, yeah, I mean, a series of mistakes were made, of course, but that's, you know, that's understandable given how we didn't know what we were going up against here. But, I mean, so at this point... I'm pretty sure we've already lost because, yeah, even if we do this, uh, sure, we can do this and damage all of them by one, but that's not going to do enough damage, and, you know, that does mean that now we're going to lose. Maeve! No! Game just giving us a dramatic pause here. Um, I'm pretty sure Meave is dead. I think? Yes. Okay. So let's restart it. I think we have a much better idea of at least what not to do. We at least have a much better sense of what not to do. So, as for what we want to do first, I do think the Wiggenberg first is probably ideal. You could potentially go with the Stray's Bomber, and if you do... You might even want to do the melee row, because again, of course, all of those Foglets are going to want to try to uh, move over there. Remind me, though, it's turn start is when the damage from fire gets triggered. So I'm just trying to think, if we have it in the melee row, does that mean the Foglets are ever going to get damage from it? I mean, if we're perfect and no Foglet ever makes it into the melee row, then... Hmm. Well, I guess, I guess they start in the range row. If they start in the range row, at the end of their first turn, move to the melee row. That melee row is on fire. Then we do something on our turn, start of their next turn. They have a chance of getting destroyed by that fire, but of course, if we're relying on that fire to take them out, and it doesn't proc, then that means we're losing the palisade, but that may just be a sacrifice, a risk that we have to take. I think we do go Wagenberg first, because it does mean we're getting as much damage as possible out of that Wagenberg. So we do not want to use the Stray's Bomber unless... Hold on. Oh, me is mobile. I was going to say. Yeah, unless we can move some of our own units, because we moved the Foglets last time, but then our last uh, movement was on the Ancient Foglet, and that, of course, backfired big time. But, uh, we could still move the Wagenberg. Not necessarily sure that we want to do that. And put it in the melee row where it's going to be a little bit harder to fit things in. But, I mean, assuming that our opponent does destroy some of these Palisades, then that is possible. You know? That is actually, I think that is a little intriguing. I think we might want to do that. I think we might want to do that. We'll play the Stray Slinger here so that we will get at least some damage on the Wagenberg. So we move you, and then we move you... Uh, do we damage it by two? Okay, so it will survive. Wagenberg will survive. Also, it didn't move. Okay. Uh, oh, is this this is completely full. Okay, so never mind. It doesn't even matter. Uh, the damage to us doesn't matter, so that'll be fine. More importantly, we fend off the Foglets for a little while longer... And then I think what we do is we... Huh. question is the timing of the fire. Because it's another one where the earlier you do it, the better. 
I wonder if maybe you just need to, well, I wonder if maybe you just take the hit from the first round of Foglets and you don't yet move them with the Slinger, because, again, the earlier you get the fire, the better. Because if we do it here, then there's a chance we remove some of them. There's a chance that we don't. And, uh, I mean, we can start to consider going with Rivian Sapper, yes. Destroy you, destroy you, damage you. So it would, it would be the best short-term answer. But, I mean, early on, I think we need to think long-term. So I, I think we still this do this. But I do feel like perhaps... Hmm. And if we go Wagenberg now, we can guarantee we get rid of two Foglets. So at worst, we're losing two Palisades. I guess we do this. So we can get the Wagenberg back with you. Oh, that does damage the Ancient Foglet, right? Okay, so... Either of these Foglets could potentially get destroyed by the fire. It's possible. Actually, they both did. Wow, we got very lucky there. Okay, so that totally bailed us out in that case. Also, not sure why it took damage from the fire at the end of their turn. That seemed odd. Okay. Um, I think... I think we go Rivian Sapper here. Destroy, and then damage. My question is, with the Lyrian Hajuk... Uh... When we give the charge back to the Waiting Bird, does it trigger instantly? Like, does it basically gain zeal? Or do we still need to wait a turn before we can use that ability? Because that affects, do we save this for our very last card? Or does it need to be our second to last card? Either way, I think we are still going Rivian Sapper here. Stop your yapping and start digging. Okay. So that means we got rid of one of the Foglets, and we may get rid of this one with the fire, depending on if it procs. Doesn't look like it did. That means they'll get rid of one of our Palisades. That was understandable that that was eventually going to happen. Okay, so now... Again, that question. Does this immediately give us the charge back on the Wagenberg, or do we need to wait? I think... I think either way... The difference between, if we play this now, then we would give the Wagenberg charges back when it has two armor, because it gained one from playing this. So that means we would guarantee we get rid of this Foglet. We would damage these two down to two power and potentially remove them with the fire. There is no difference between doing that and damaging them by three if we were to play this on our last turn, because, uh, you know, we don't have a, another source of one damage to finish off. A foglet that has one power so uh, there, there's no functionally no difference so i think we play this Life at me proud. No, and proud. it looks like it does not immediately oh, I, I, oh well i played in the wrong place so no it's not going to trigger because i played it in the wrong place i was at first i was like oh well uh it clearly did not trigger immediately well i mean that was just a, obviously a very silly move. I mean, we could potentially get extremely lucky and get bailed out by the fire, but I'm not sure if that's gonna happen. <laughs> um, let's see, we would need to remove three of these guys. It may actually be possible. We don't deserve it after that huge misplay. But we do this. That gets rid of one of them. This gets rid of an... or has the chance of getting rid of another? No. No, oh, okay. So it is impossible at this point. So yeah, there's a chance this Foglet could get destroyed by the fire, and then in that case, the Ancient Foglet would be at 5, but that's the best we can do. So, yeah, it's the difference between uh, misplaying this last card and not misplaying this last card, or second to last card, but you know what I mean. So, yeah, uh, we we definitely know. We know what we need to do. That was just me misclicking. Okay. Okay, so what did we say? First was Wagenberg, right? I think what we established. We we're talking about maybe setting the row on fire first. But I think our methodology was going to be sound. So now we do this. Just to bide some time. I feel like there is a chance. There may technically be more than one way to succeed here. Okay, now we set this on fire. And we did get a little lucky with the fire procs last time around. So I don't know if we're going to experience that same bit of luck this time. Use Wayne Burke here. That means that, at worst, we're losing two Palisades, but hopefully, hopefully some of these Foglets will go away. I think we got rid of both of them last time. Oh, we got rid of none of them this time. Okay, so yes, we, we did not get nearly as lucky. 
But again, for some reason, when they moved in, they took damage. So that was odd. But okay, so now we go Rivian Sapper. And it just basically means that this turn is going to be bigger with the Rivian Sapper. We do this. We do this. And we do that. And that means at worst we're taking, uh, we're losing one Palisade here. But we didn't, so that's good. Okay, so now I need to play this in the right spot. Give one charge to the card to the right. So that means play you here. Okay, and it does trigger immediately. It does trigger immediately. So it shouldn't ma- Um. Uh, hmm. hmm. Hold on. No, we wait. We don't use this yet. Because we need three Foglet kills. And there are obviously only two Foglets out here at the moment. So uh, we want you to spawn a couple additional Foglets, have them move into the melee row, and then we'll damage them all with the Wagenberg. And on the same turn, we'll hit them with the Rivian Sapper. Means we'll lose two Palisades, but we can survive that. That's fine. And big fire procs there. In fact, that just means we can finish the job with the Wagenberg. Don't even need the Rivian Sapper. I'll, either one of them could finish it. Uh, by themselves, so, I mean, sure, I guess we'll do this. So there it is. We had it figured out a little while ago, you know, uh, misclick, misclick set us back a little bit, but there we are. Alright. So, let's see, we get wood and gold and this note. This forest belongs to the Anche. Leave this place at once. Cursed Dwan, or you shall remain here for all eternity. Eldane. That is the leader of the elves that we have heard about. Uh, seemingly threatening us. I mean, I don't know how he would know that we were going to encounter this random group of foglets. <laughs> what, did he write that note for the foglets and just so happened that it also applies to us? That seems a little strange. I don't know, Eldane. I feel like I need to call your bluff on that one. That's just a little too, little too strange that you happened to know that we are going to wander off the beaten path and come across that note. But anyways, I think this is a good place for us to wrap up here. So thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time.